Welcome back to Fintech Insider Focus in association with Visa. In this show, we take a burning question from financial services across the globe and really put it under the microscope with explainers, expert panels, and in-depth interviews, all to bring the global community into focus. Today, I am joined again by my Fintech Insider co-host for this month, David Rolfe, who is the head of Visa Ventures. How's it going, David? Very well, David. How are you? Busy, busy. Busy times in fintech. It uh, never stops, does it? But uh, in this second part of our focus, we're going to be really focusing on the question, what are American VCs looking for in the market today? If you haven't heard part one of this conversation, go find it wherever you found this podcast and listen to our panel discussion with amazing guests from Fin Capital and Commerce Ventures. We spoke about the key challenges facing VC investment in today's market, as well as the key trends that got our guests pretty excited about the opportunities ahead of us. Uh, David, maybe to recap and uh, get everybody into that, I mean, what is Visa's connection to the VC space? And and why was this an important topic to explore? Yeah, sure. So, um, I, as you mentioned, David, I, I lead our uh, Visa Ventures, which is the the equity investing uh, arm inside Visa. And so, we're we're not a traditional venture capital fund with a limited partner and general partner. We're investing Visa's cash, right? And why do we do that? Not just in amazing companies, but really in companies that we see as potentially extremely valuable commercial and strategic partners uh, for growing the evolution of digital payments and importantly all the services around those so think of fraud data privacy uh, security um, all these things that relate to payments and so what my team does is is really simple like we look for companies that are great potential commercial partners and if they're looking to raise money and we can be helpful to them as an equity investor as well as all the commercial partnerships um, we're very keen on this and look innovation is the lifeblood of our industry visa has been innovative for a long time we partner with innovators uh, and so getting to know those companies, getting to build relationships with them, and if an equity investment can be helpful to that, we're, we're always keen to have that discussion. It's a fascinating one, isn't it? I mean, there's lots of different types of investors, but but the strategic nature of the investment that you guys make in that sense, it's, um, you know, it's it's chess stuff, right? It's not just, uh, as you say, for the financial returns, it's for the the broader benefit that you can bring. And, and that's a, an amazing thing, actually, both from your perspective, but actually for the people who you're investing in, right? Absolutely. I mean, you know, we, we don't write huge checks, right? So, so why are people interested in taking an investment from Visa? It's not because we're providing, you know, money that's prettier or greener than anybody else's, right? It's because what comes along with that is um, the support, the engagement, the connectivity. And yeah, if you're an early stage company and you're able to say, hey, Visa invested in us, then that, that can be helpful with customers. And we've seen that over and over where the announcement of an investment from Visa becomes a commercial asset for companies. So, yeah, I mean, it's um, it's it's always interesting um, to see what people are doing and building. And we're very keen to be part of those conversations. We work with a lot of the top venture firms as well. And endlessly interesting stuff out there. Absolutely. So much potential, so many opportunities. Uh, so in this second episode, we're going to be sitting down with a big name guest from the VC space to really deep dive into this topic. It's a super interesting chat that you're definitely not going to want to miss. You'll hear that after a short message from Visa. Don't go anywhere. Visa's FinTech Fast Track program is streamlining the onboarding process for FinTechs, enabling them to gain access to Visa's powerful capabilities and network. Visa and their enablement partners help fintechs launch and scale cards, virtual credentials, and disbursement programs. To learn more, visit partner.visa.com. Hello and welcome, LFG people, to Fintech Insider, Blockchain Insider, 11FS Spotlight, 11FS Explores, Open Mic Nights, After Dark. Through our podcasts, videos, newsletters, and live events, we have a direct line to a truly global fintech community. So if you're looking to sponsor and collaborate on content that connects with everybody from fintech beginners to the biggest VCs, then chat to our team at sponsors at 11fs.com or visit 11fs.com to find out more. Long live the community. From two Davids to another David. I'm David Barton Grimley, Director of Fintech Strategy at 11FS, and it's great to be joined by an amazing guest to dive further into the question, 
What are America's VCs looking for in today's market? I'm delighted to be joined by Adams Conrad, Principal at QED Investors. How are you doing, Adams? I'm doing well. Thank you for having me, David. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to have you. For our audience, can you tell us the elevator pitch on what QED is and what it does? Of course. So QED Investors is a fintech-focused venture firm. We are a team of fintech veterans having invested in over 200 fintech companies to date. Uh, We invest globally in everything from pre-PowerPoint all the way up to pre-IPO. We are currently investing at a fund seven, and we recently closed our eighth early stage fund and our second growth fund with total committed capital just under a billion. And we're, we're really a team of former operators that loves building and investing in fintech businesses. I love that. Pre-PowerPoint is a great term. I feel like I should use that as well. Listen, I'd like to start by talking about you and your background. You know, you mentioned that QED is a team of, um, of former operators. It's kind of interesting, you know, having made the switch from a successful career at fintechs and into the VC world. Sometimes being a bit of an outsider looking at VCs, it can feel like a bit of a closed shop, right? People who tend to work in VCs have almost come through the ranks of, you know, being a VC all the way from grad school up to up to partner. I mean, how how important is it, would you say, for investors to have a working knowledge of startups and companies before becoming a VC? So I'm quite biased here in that I am a, am a firm believer in the importance of having an operator's mentality and an operator's perspective when investing in early stage companies. Starting a business is really, really hard. And I, I think empathy is paramount. Having an investor that uh, can not only identify an entrepreneur that is going to be able to run through that brick wall, if you will. But, but even a step further than that, an investor that can help that entrepreneur, that, that's even harder. And, and I, I view that as a, a tremendous uh, privilege and a tremendous responsibility to, to really work with entrepreneurs on their journey to uh, building a great business. As you mentioned, uh, prior to QED, I was with uh, Quovo and then joined Plaid as a part of that acquisition. I've spent my entire time or my entire career in fintech and the majority of my career in startups and and really enjoy uh, and that, that great privilege of working with, with these entrepreneurs to help them build a great business and kink the curve on outcomes. Ultimately, we think about startups as a series of hypotheses. Each round of funding fuels a series of experiments to prove or disprove a given hypothesis. And when, when we think about this, you can really view a startup as a, uh, as, as a function of 90% to the power of five, six, seven, however many things that you think that need to go right. And each one of those things might have a high probability of going right. But when you start to stack those things together and those assumptions and hypotheses together, well, of course, the, the uh, aggregate probability starts to come down. And really, we, we view VCs and, and our, ourselves, and, and I view myself, as having a uh, meaningful role and a responsibility to help de-risk a given company's vision and what they can accomplish. With my background, uh, as you might be able to imagine, I spend most of my time uh, on the go-to-market side of things, uh, and particularly uh, working with B2B fintech startups and, and uh, oftentimes at the earliest stages. You're right. The reality of running a, running a startup is, is one of, of constantly iterating and learning from customers and learning from the industry and also learning from the VCs that they work for, right? That's one of the major things that, that VCs can also provide to the, to the fintech. I mean, you mentioned empathy there. Is, is there anything particular from your experience um, working in the fintech world which help you now? I, you know, I think one of the, the biggest ones, and, and as I think about my time in an account management role with Quovo and the growth team at Plaid, being able to really understand why it's difficult and, and the, the granularity of why it's difficult. It's, it's easy when you're uh, sitting on, on the investor side of the table to say in the board meeting, well, have you thought about growing faster? 
why don't why don't you just have more revenue? That would be really nice. But and and I'm being a little facetious here, but re- really it, it is absolutely imperative to give that advice to be able to put yourself in the shoes of the operator and and to understand why it's not just as easy as do more, better, faster, stronger. Uh, and being able to weigh the trade-offs, perhaps there's a impact to culture. Perhaps there's an impact to uh, resource allocation. And in and, and my experience and in my background here, I don't think that's really possible without that level of empathy and without being able to say, I've been there before and I can give you that great advice. And, and David, one, one part that I think is equally as important and, and important for an investor to do is acknowledge and, and say the words, I don't know. It's, it's easy to uh, slot into Twitter platitudes and, and kind of staying at the business school level. This is what I read in the textbook, uh, generic advice. But generic advice is generic advice and usually wrong. And there's a reason that, uh, that the entrepreneur, that founder is bringing you a problem. And it's because they already tried the generic advice. If, if it could be solved with the textbook answer, it probably wouldn't be coming up in the first place. And, and I think there's a real responsibility of investors to, to have that in mind and, and to take that to heart when they're digging into a problem alongside an entrepreneur. And that moves us nicely into investing and the business of investing um, in your world. What what do you look for from a startup when choosing to invest? It really varies. So as I mentioned earlier, we'll invest in every type of company from pre-PowerPoint all the way up to pre-IPO. Our sweet spot is at Series A, but it it really varies in terms of geo, in terms of stage and size of business, and in terms of what what that business is. Uh, looking to accomplish in the, the sector that they find themselves in. Though there are a few consistent threads that no matter the stage of the business, we're looking for. And, and ultimately, those are strong in economics, an ability to articulate a clear learning agenda, and a path to profitability. That latter one is increasingly important, and, and I'm sure we'll, we'll tackle that more during our conversation here. But for me in particular, I spend most of my time on incubation. We have a long history of incubating businesses here at QED, and we call this strategy belay, the, the climbing term where you'll uh, help the climber, and if they fall, you're their backstop, you're, you're their rope. And, and given our experience building, investing, and operating fintech businesses over the past 15, 17 years, we have a real opportunity to combine talent, ideas, and capital to build exceptional businesses. We've incubated a number of businesses over the past few years, uh, including WageStream, Caribou, and ClearScore, and we're eager to do more. So as, as I look out from that vantage point, I'm, I'm really excited about the prospects and the opportunity to work with second-time founders who are looking to build businesses across the five pillars of financial services and, and impact how money is stored, moved, invested, lent, and protected, or a combination of, of those various pillars. And with uh, the, the recent market turmoil, I uh, ha- have seen a, a surge in folks looking to build businesses. And that, to me, is one of the most exciting parts about where we are in fintech right now, that uh, as, as the uh, valuations are compressing, As the charts you look at are somber and at times depressing, the talent that is looking to start new businesses and solve core critical problems in financial services globally and and here in the U.S. couldn't be stronger and couldn't be more exciting. That is absolutely fascinating. I mean, is there, would you say there is a specific thing about the economy, about the disruption in the economy, the uncertainty, that perhaps there is a moment in time now which is inspiring people to go into fintech? I mean, you mentioned there second time founders of people who have kind of been there and done that and maybe coming back into it and saying like, hey, I want to get stuck in and what is new here or uncertain. I, I think I think a big driver here is folks looking at 
the the landscape of opportunities and saying, you know what, I, the, the risk profile of joining a mega tech company is maybe not as safe as I originally thought it was. And I, I have learned over the course of the years how to build great businesses. And that the combination of an understanding of what the risk profile looks like at a much, much larger tech company compared to the earliest of stages makes that bridge a shorter one to cross. Now, there's still, um, it's still, it's still a bridge that must be crossed that not, not everyone is, uh, interested in starting companies, but those that are, I'm finding are, are eager to do so now. And, and one of the other drivers here, second time founders in particular that I would talk to, uh, in 2020 and 2021 would remark, uh, this, this theme you're talking to me about, Adams, is, is exciting, but there's going to be 10 people that build in this space. Well, how, that sounds, that sounds like a gauntlet. Uh, why, why would I do that? And, and instead now, in, in, in conversations I'm having, potential entrepreneurs and second time founders are saying, this, this looks like a blue ocean. And, and maybe there's one or two competitors, but not 10. And, and that opportunity, I think they see as, as, as unique. And, and uh, I'm finding the se- second time founders I'm eager to work with in particular are focused on that side of the equation rather than the availability of capital. Capital is always available for the, the right companies, the right founders, and, and the, the right um, uh, startups to, to uh, tackle real and meaningful problems. And are you seeing the wider VC industry in the U.S. react almost in the same way? Is that is that how all of you are looking at it, or are you seeing any sort of contrasts in in fintech investments from from VCs and and how they're raising funding? Ooh, that's an interesting question. I don't think so, um, though it does vary very much based off of stage. So those focused at the earliest of stages, and 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 myself included. Are, I think are more inclined to see this phenomenon than those focused on the later stages. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll get into that a, a bit later, I'm sure, but there's, there's a, a bit of a champagne days and hangover effect uh, for those that are in the later stages that uh, the newer companies, of course, don't have any of that baggage and, and can start anew. Within fintech in particular, um, given that's all, all we focus in, uh, we're, we're a little bit biased, but do believe uh, fin- the fintech sector is ripe for continued innovation. And uh, one note in particular is businesses and banks' desire to continue to innovate and to continue to shift towards digital is very alive and well. And ultimately, that's driven by consumers. The consumers' desire to engage with financial products in a digital-first way, that, that t- has tipped those floodgates have opened. The genie is out of the bottle. It's not going back in the bottle. So w- with that in mind, um, there, there's more blue ocean than there ever has been before. There's more opportunity than there ever has been before. And uh, the second time founders across FinTech are seeing that and, and finding that opportunity to capitalize on. And I guess you, you might even be able to make the argument that the tightening of, of credit and access to funding almost forces people to be more rigorous about the kind of ventures that they pursue and the, and the decisions that they, that they make. I mean, listening to you talk, it, it, it seems like there is almost a new seriousness that's come into the, into the fintech industry because, you know, as we know, it's, it, it has been free-flowing access to, to free money for years and years and years, which have created all, all sorts of, you know, some good things and some, you know, unicorns and exits, but also some quite spectacular failures. I mean, is there, is there also something about the relationship between the founders and the VCs that, are, that, that, that is changing both in pre and post funding, um, in terms of the advice that you that you bring to businesses and how you help to to grow those ventures, there is, and and there, that relationship between entrepreneurs and investors is um, is more important than it ever has been. Uh, I mentioned earlier, we are a hands on 
venture capital firm. We, we in, invest in businesses where we believe that we can keep the curve on outcomes. And uh, you, you mentioned uh, the, the uh, shift in the environment. One very positive change has been on pace. In 2020 and 2021, we were seeing deals, folks would open up a data room on Monday and term sheets would be due on Friday. And I'd tell entrepreneurs, you and I, if, if, if we look to do this deal together, you and I are going to speak every single week for the next seven years. That's a meaningful commitment. And, and it takes oftentimes more than a week to find, is that relationship here on a personal level? But put the business aside. But when you call me at 8 p.m. on a Friday, do I say, ugh? David's calling. I have to take this. Or is it, hey, David, thank you for calling. I know because you're calling me at 8 p.m. on a Friday, it's probably not great news. And I'm excited to tackle that problem or opportunity with you. And taking time to diagnose that on both sides of the table is imperative. And this new environment that we're in now is giving founders and giving investors an opportunity to really explore that relationship and ensure that it's a good and a sound one. Now, when we look at how the relationship has changed and evolved, there are, without a doubt, more challenging conversations happening now than there were 18 months ago. Uh, over uh, half of our U.S. portfolio companies have had to do a reduction in force of some sort. That is excruciatingly painful. For the for the investors, for the entrepreneurs, for and, and most importantly for those impacted, and working through those challenges is not trivial in the least, and um, oh, it takes something from you on, on, a, on a personal level. It, you you, uh, you really have to wrestle with these with these challenging challenging decisions, and and that has put strain on these relationships but has also elevated these relationships and made them more important than they ever were before. One thing I'll share specifically um, on, on the reductions in force, as, as those I know are, have, have impacted many, um, as, as we have gone through those and, and as I have uh, had to work through those with founders and as founders have had to work through those themselves, I don't think anybody wants to do that. Um, when, you, when you get the Excel sheet, I think it's just imperative you hide the employee number and you only look at names. And and that that's when you sit and you look at, of course, roles and the other factors, but but you look at names and you say, this, I, I've, I've got to wrestle with some really difficult decisions here. And that's where we want to jump in the weeds with founders and, and uh, work through these problems with them side by side. And I'll, I'll share maybe another, perhaps more positive anecdote as, as the macro economic factors have changed and shifted and inflation has, has impacted many um, from a day-to-day -day basis as cost of capital has impacted many others on a day-to-day -day basis. We've seen a number of portfolio companies focus and or shift their focus to help consumers and businesses tackle those problems and, and, and overcome the challenges that this uh, evolving macroeconomic environment has presented them with. Rain here in the U.S. enables earned wage access, and they, they've uh, invested meaningfully in their product to enable more employees to use Rain's tools to understand how much have they earned, and if needed, access that capital that they've already earned. And, and it enables them to break that cycle of payday lending and, and start to actually pay off their debts on time and avoid, uh, at times, egregious late fees and, and penalties. And, and at the same time, start to have a really good understanding of how much are they earning day over day and hour over hour. Another one I'll share is ClearScore, uh, where they're helping, uh, in, in the UK, helping customers understand what is their credit and what does that mean for them? How does how how can they access various products and uh, what that what changes could they make to their financial life that would impact 
the products they, they can access and the cost of those products they can access. So that's been really exciting. And I've, and I've had the privilege of working in particular closely with Rain as they've uh, honed in and focused on, on unlocking capital for customers. You mentioned the UK there. I mean, it'd be interesting to get your perspective almost on the international um, market. So, you know, we've seen the fintech downturn. Do you, do you think there's a chance that global markets will awaken almost before the US market or is the US market going to lead the way? This is a really good question. And I might, I might cheat and say both. And the, the, reason, the reason I um, say that is because when we look at some of the themes we're most excited about here in the US, they're inherently global themes. We're spending a lot of time in trade and in logistics. That's an inherently global business to start. And when, when we take a step back and think about why, why is that happening? Our, our thesis is, and my thesis is, that money is inherently global and it's becoming increasingly interconnected. FinTech is enabling that. FinTech is benefiting from that. And, and as a result, US businesses that are global in nature and which, which increasingly many US businesses are global in nature, either because they have employees overseas and, and globally, or they have customers overseas and globally, or they have suppliers. It, it, it's almost challenging to find a business these days that doesn't have some touch globally. And, and as a result, US companies uh, and US uh, fintech businesses will become increasingly global and, and as, a, as a result, I think we'll see a, an opening and a reopening that's, that's a, a global one, first and foremost, not a U.S. and then or a international and then U.S. The, the other note here on uh, the, the global side of things is uh, the impact uh, that multi-currency has on businesses. And, and that's a real opportunity here for fintech when we talk about themes. Uh, Meow is a uh, portfolio company of ours that has done uh, tremendous work in enabling treasury management for businesses of all sorts and shapes and sizes. And, and uh, they have started by unlocking access to treasury bills and enabling CFOs to manage their uh, treasury from a single pane of glass just as they might their own personal financial portfolio and their own internal personal treasury management is starting to look like corporate treasury management. And they've, they've also done a nice job here expanding into multi-currency support, which is, which is imperative for any global business. It's amazing to see how fintech is really scaling to solve deeper needs. I mean, listening to you talk about treasury, earned wage access, you know, multi-currency FX over the last few years. It's amazing to see these commercial corporate business um, use cases actually getting solved by fintech. Um, and we could talk about this forever, but we're right about time. Um, so final question for you, Adams. What would your advice be uh, for companies looking for investment from an American VC right now? It's imperative to remember, and, and we've all been reminded of this over the past 12 or so months, that a startup's primary competitive advantage is singularity of focus and speed. And my, my primary advice to, to startups of any stage at the, at the moment is to, to do everything you can to anchor on that singularity of focus and drive towards speed. That, that is how challenging big problems will be solved, how uh, startups will reach escape velocity, and, and how they will leave the impact that, that, that they're seeking to leave. The, um, the, the, the piece kind of beyond that that I would keep an eye on is uh, a clear articulation of your unit economics, of your learning agenda, and your path to profitability. Those, those three pieces are paramount for any business uh, looking to raise, grow, and scale at the moment. And on that note, 
that wraps up this edition of FinTech Insider Focus in association with Visa. Thank you so much for joining me, Adams. Where can people find out more about you and QED? QEDinvestors.com and uh, my Twitter is the Adams Conrad. And you can find me on LinkedIn at David BG. Thanks for listening, everyone. And if you like what you've heard, subscribe to our podcast and please leave us a review. It helps us to make it better and helps others find the show. Be sure to check out the next batch of FinTech Insider Focus episodes in a new geography dropping in two weeks' time. Thanks very much. Goodbye. Goodbye.